good evening, you know. I'll do that one time before the end of the semester. All right, uh, if you remember last time, we had a cliffhanger, all right? And the cliffhanger was something like this. We have developed a page I see we're already having hurricane-related problems. <clears throat> All right. Uh, we developed a page that Was it position two, I think, from last time? Yeah, we developed this page to be a little more flexible than the other one. Not everything was flexible, but it was somewhat flexible insofar as that little block of content is centered. And therefore, as we make the window bigger or smaller, the, the margin on the end um, uh, expands and contracts. And we even have the benefit of having a nice little pattern there to kind of give a little bit of aesthetics to it. Um, and here's what the question was, is, was, was something like this. Let's say we want to do the following, all right? Let's say we want to make a wireframe that looks like this. Let's say we wanted a wireframe that did the same thing as this does, whereas this expands and contracts, with the difference being that the elements were laid out this way. All right? We've already done that with the, with the totally fixed layout. All right? We already did that with this guy here. More or less, we, we threw some extra stuff in. But we already did it with this layout, because as we make it, but everything's nailed down. So that was, that was relatively easy to do. All right. Let's look and let's make ourselves a position three document. And let's see what problems we run into, and let's see how we can fix those problems. All right, so let's open up position three. And remember, the wireframe we want to get is something like this. So let's get to it. The banner can stay the same, all right? We don't have to change that. The navigation, well, we can narrow the width down a little bit, and we'll make the navigation have a, naviga uh, a width of, say, 150 pixels. And let's say we want that part the content area to have a width of 400 pixels. Thank you. All right. Well, we're kind of there. We're kind of the way there, all right. Except we're not. 
All right. Now, let's go and we'll get rid of the display inline. All right, that stacks those vertically. We could get rid of the periods uh, alongside of it by doing this. But we still have this down here. Now, this isn't going to work. Can't go something like this and say, position absolute top, let's say 100 pixels left. 350 pixels. This isn't going to work, even if I'm fairly accurate with my guess here. Right? Not too bad. All right. Hmm. Can we tweak this maybe and get it to work? Well, not really, because I just happen to get lucky with the guess of that. Notice what happens if we move this. Yeah. Because remember, what does absolute mean? It means it's nailed down. All right, it's nailed down. So, clearly absolute doesn't work. So, in many things, the, absolute of, 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 uh, the opposite of absolute is relative. So, there is a relative positioning. Let's see what relative positioning buys us. All right, if we look, we can say that where do we want this guy in relation to where it's being put? Well, we want it pushed over to the left about 150, and we want it pushed up about, probably about the same. All right? So I can define position relative and say I want it pushed over to the left 150 pixels from where it otherwise would be. When you use position relative, in a nutshell what you're doing is you're saying, okay, the browser wants to put it there. Where do I want to put position it relative to where the browser wants to push it? Put it, rather. And in this case, we want to push it over 150 in that direction. So we say left 150. Top, we want it to go up. So that would be a negative amount. So let's go and put this in and see what we get. All right. Almost there. Maybe need to go a little bit further over than 150. And then we got that. All right? So we've achieved that. So that's the second sort of positioning that we can do. We can do position um, absolute that nails it down to a certain position on the screen. We can do position relative that says, that tells a browser to take where you are going to put it and make these adjustments and, and the, the, the amount of the adjustment can either be positive or negative. So we can push it further to the left or push it to the right uh, by using a negative amount or wait a minute, other way around. Push it over to the right or push it backwards to the left by using a negative amount. And likewise we can do the same thing with top. So now it doesn't matter as this gets bigger, smaller, this stays in, stays in position relative to where the rest of the stuff is positioned. So as we change the size of the window, the position of this changes, and therefore the position of this changes relative to it. All right. So that's position relative. And it's useful for, for this. 
Now, both these two techniques allow us to do uh, some good stuff here. All right? We can make a completely fixed layout, which has its advantages and it also has its disadvantages. The advantage is that you have a very tight, very strong control over exactly how it's going to look. The disadvantage is that, especially these days with mobile devices and just such a variety of platforms on which people can be viewing a web page, to have the page look identical across all platforms actually really isn't a good thing, isn't a practical thing, uh, simply because um, the platforms are so varied as far as their screen size, uh, etc. We have this relative that gives us a little bit of flexibility and a little bit of, of wiggle room uh, on this. Um, the last technique that we're going to study is uh, a very liquidy technique, and that is the technique of floating. All right? And I'm going to start with a brand new example on this one. I'm not going to go back and, and redo these other ones. Before we do that, I'm going to try to give an overview of what floating does for us and how it works. All right? Now, let's imagine we have a window. And I'm going to say for simplicity's sake, it's a thousand pixels wide, all right, just so the math is easy. And in this example also, in the first example that I discussed, I'm not going to include any kind of border or padding or margin, all right? But remember that the border, padding, and margin will all get added on to uh, the size of whatever, uh, the, the width of whatever I'm talking about. All right. Let's say I have something that is uh, an element that is 300 pixels wide. All right. Actually, let me draw it more to scale. This is 1,000, and let's say this is 300. If I float an element next to it, what it does is it will sh try to shove that element next to the thing that is to its left, if I float left. So I'm going to put in float left on this one. And let's say if there is also, let's say I have a bunch of 300 pixel blocks that I want to stack next to each other, all right? The first one can fit on the screen no problem, right? The second one, can I slide it to this alongside of it? Will there be enough space on the page for it? Yes, there will. Can I slide another one alongside of it? Yes, I can. Can I slide another one alongside of it? No. All right, because if this is 300, 300, and 300, 900 pixels, I can't put this alongside of it, so I will drop it down underneath it. Now, here's the interesting thing. As I resize the window and make it bigger or smaller, let's say I cut it down to 800 pixels. All of a sudden, this guy can no longer fit alongside its element to the left, its neighbor to the left. So what happens to it? It drops down to there. So the page adjusts itself based on the size of the window. And that's one of the first steps that we can take um, to make uh, uh, layouts work better in a mobile, is that we can make the, the page customized to the screen, all right, the size of the screen. Now, I realize that that might be a little vague to talk about it in those terms. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a little example. Um, before we go in and actually do this, I'm going to go and create uh, an example um, of not a real web page, but just some divs that we're going to stack next, next to each other. 
and we'll review how that works, and then we will um, actually get into to, to using like actual divs um, that have actual content in, and go back and maybe do a liquid uh, design for it. So let's go in and let's make. position four and I'm going to sort of start with a clean slate here get rid of all the CSS code. And I'm going to create some new HTML here. Now I'm just going to create four divs that say div 1, div 2, div 3, div 4. Now, without any sort of style, we should know how this is going to look. Whoops. Without any sort of style oops, on this, it's going to look like just three divs stacked on top of each other. Right? Divs are block tags, so therefore they will be stacked on top of each other. All right, div one, div two, div three, div four. All right, let's start playing with some of the attributes of these. All right, let's go into our CSS file and start playing with some of the attributes. I'm going to give it a width of 300 pixels, just like in the example, and I'm going to give it a color of red. And I'll do that for the other three divs. I'll give them their own colors. All right, so now we have our four divs, and they're stacked on top of each other. Why? Because they're block tags. Changing the width doesn't change the fact that they're block tags, right? It's just instead of having a width that goes, or a block that goes all the way across, it's a width now that only goes 300 pixels across. Now, you'll notice something, that there is some blank space between them. Why is there blank space between them? Well, we didn't put it in there, right? So it must be default behavior of the browser. So let's go in for good measure, and I will put on each of these a margin of zero pixels. And this should smash everything together. Or not. Let's skip that part. That's not important. All right. What I'm 
going to do now is I'm going to float each of these to the left. So I'm going to say float. left and we'll see what that does. All right, we have a nice little two by two. Watch as we make it wider, it pops up there. So we have div one, two, three, and four. Our screen is probably around 1,000 pixels wide now, right? That's about the full width of the screen. And therefore, three things with a width of 300 can fit in that, all right? Now, as I go in and notice how we're probably right a little above 900 now. As we go and we hit that edge, boom, it pushes it down. If we go further enough, it's going to stack them like that, all right? So let's imagine if we were viewing this, and again, this, this doesn't have actual content in it, but it just has these blocks in it. But let's imagine if we were going to view this on a full browser versus a mobile browser. On a full browser, on a full screen, I'm going to see the page like this, all right? If I go to a device that has a narrow screen, I'm going to see it like this. Which, if you think about it, probably isn't a bad idea for mobile web pages. All right? Because most mobile web pages, you know, are, are typically not multiple column. They're typically one column, and, and that is a reasonable model for this. All right? So that's the idea of floating. Now, few things to come in mind uh, to keep in mind all right we can float either on the page or we can float within a container all right i'm going to go and revise our position 3 example the example that we did via a relative positioning and do that by floating instead all right it's so the thing that's important to understand is that these techniques are, are, are mix and match. It's not as though you do one thing and, and that's it. You don't, you don't use any of these other techniques. So I'm going to go and copy this. And then I'm going to go and we'll revise it to use floating instead of relative positioning. I'm going to say that navigation, I want to float it to the left. I'm going to put it as far over within its container as it can. Now, what's going to be different between this example and the last example is this nav div is part of another div, right? The nav div is part of the container, or the nav is part of the container, which means that if we float it, all right, if we float it like we're doing in the CSS, it's not going to float it outside of that container. It's going to stay within that container. Likewise, if I go and I float this, that too is going to stay within the container.
All right. Now, a couple things are wrong here. Let's go and float the header for good measure. Uh, I'm going to make a little tweak to well let, let, let's talk about that. I'm going to do the style based on the ID not on the class. Actually, I'm just going to do the one part. I'll get rid of the second part. That unnecessarily complicates this. All right. So there we go. All right. Notice how this works. It sort of wrapped that around the navigation. Actually, we were looking at the wrong thing. That's what I expected to see. All right. Now, we notice as, as, a, uh, as a student observed the problem, namely that this stuff no longer has the white background. And if you look at this, it seems a paradox, right? Because this container has a background of white, and yet, when we look at, and that container contains the header, the navigation, and the section. Yet clearly, something isn't working out right because we don't see the white background behind that. All right, what can we do to, why is this happening and what we can do to fix it? Why this is happening is that when you float elements, you sort of take them out of the normal flow of the page. So it's, it's as though they're not really, they don't act like they're part of that container, even though they are part of that container, because we've taken it out of the float of the page. Now, how could we fix this? We could fix this a couple different ways. One thing that we could do is we could go in and we could put a background on each one of those individual elements. And that would get us pretty much what we wanted, maybe a little bit different. All right, moving in the right direction there. The other thing that we can do, though, is we can put an element on the page that sort of says stop the floating. All right. Don't allow this to float up against anything. And that'll sort of put, uh, put, uh, you know, put it back in the flow so that our container will know where the container starts and where the container ends. So I can do something like this. Footer. And then I can put in my CSS footer clear both. And now notice we're back to that because that clear both sort of ends the floating, it sort of cancels out of the floating. So now that div knows that it extends from there to there. It's a little bit of a trick and it's annoying, but um, again, it works. 
Now, a few things to keep in mind. If we don't like the fact, for example, that the, the text is right up against the navigation, how could we fix that? Pardon me? Padding or margin. So we could go and we could put a padding on our div here. Pushes it over a little bit. All right. Do keep in mind, though, that anything we, we put to the padding and margin of things adds to the total width that they take on the screen. Let's go back to this example four. If I give this guy a big border, and a big padding and a big margin it's going to take up a lot more space on the on the page so much in fact that, that at this screen size it can only fit one of those in and now it fits all three of them as we make it narrower Boom, those pop down to that. As we make it narrower still, it goes down to that. What I like to do is make a meaningful page that is has everything floated in it, just to give you a sense of, of how that would work. So let me go and let me copy. our fifth example and we'll make it a hundred percent floating Before I do this, let me go and let me draw the wireframe that I want. Let's say the wireframe I want looks like this. On a wide screen, I want it to look like this, kind of like all the examples or many of the examples that we, we've been going over so far. I want it to look that way on a wider screen. On a narrower screen, let's say, on a mobile screen, maybe I want the page to look like this on a narrower screen. The banner, the navigation, and then the content. So we have two different layouts that depending on the size of the screen, the page will, will take one of the two layouts. So let's go ahead and do this. First of all, let's look at this wireframe. All right. All right, my header, I want to extend all the way across the page. So how do you suppose I can do that? What would be the style rule that I would put in for the header? Width of what? 
get the get rid of the style rule for a container. There we go. Goes all the way across. Now, the nav, I can give it a width of 150 pixels, and I can float it to the left. The body, I can give a width of 450 pixels and float it to the left. And then I have something like this. All right. Now, again, watch what happens as the screen gets narrower. ends up looking like that. And again, that's a reasonable way for a page to look on a mobile device. Now, it's not particularly fancy, but in, in we could improve it with some colors and with some other things. But we're moving in the direction of where we can have one page that looks at least presentable, both in the context of a mobile environment and on a desktop environment. And that's a good thing as mobile use and mobile web browsing use has, has grown and doesn't appear to have any end in sight as far as its growth goes. Now, this is sort of the basic of it. When you start adding little wrinkles in it, it becomes very confusing and a little harder to debug. For example, you can put percentages in instead of an absolute number for these things. You saw that with the banner, I put in 100%. I could do percentages of the other thing as well. So, for example, I could say the width of the navigation, instead of 150 pixels, is 20%. The part one, instead of having a width of 400 pixels, I could say it has a width of 60%. And then we can look at it. And that width actually gets bigger and smaller as much as it can. Well, actually until, no, oh, that's not good, right? Any way around that? Yeah, there, there's a, a number of ways that we could do that. One thing that we could do is we could put a minimum width of, let's say, 100 pixels. And notice that it gets smaller to a certain point then it doesn't get any smaller anymore. Now I'm going to do something here that might be puzzling. I'm going to make the width of the navigation 20% and the width of part 1 80%. 80% 80 plus 20% is 100%, right? They should be able to fit side by side. People are shaking their heads. I know it's Monday, but I'm pretty sure 80% plus 20% equals 100%. Ooh, you guys are shaking your head for good reason. All right. 80 per, or 20% plus 80% doesn't fit across. Doesn't fit across 100% of the screen. Why is that? Exactly, because I, I'm, I'm muddying the water by putting in some borders here. And this is where things get incredibly complicated if you use percentages for one thing and absolute numbers for another. The border is five pixels. So it'll be five to the right, five to the left. It'll be 10 pixels no matter how big the window is. So if the width is 20%, if the window is, let's say, 1,000 pixels, 
that will take up 210 pixels, right? Because 20% is the width, so that's 20% of 1,000 is 200, plus the 5 pixels on either side. If the width was, say, 500, then 20% would be 100 pixels, plus the 10 pixels on either side, so it will be 110. So it can be tricky sometimes when you do that. Usually when I'm doing something like this, I will go in and instead of adding up to 100%, I make, might make it add up to like 95%. All right. In which case, at wide screens, yeah, it, it still fits in. As I get smaller, though, at a certain point, boom, it's going to drop it below. A few things to remember um, with this is, again, we can apply the minimum height uh, or minimum width. In addition, um, let's put in, let's say, let's put in a big Put in an H1 here. Put an H1 in there as well. Okay, I guess there the minimum width comes into play. Ah, I guess here's what I'm trying to show. Notice down here, I said the width of this is 75%. And yet, when I get a certain size, it doesn't can continue to make it smaller. Why? Because it doesn't know what to do with the word heading can't split the word heading in half or anything. So even though I've said 75%, that's bigger than 75% because the browser decided, hey, I'm not going to make it any smaller than the width of that word. I'm not going to make that div. All right, so that is sort of the third technique that we have, and that is of floating. Um, there's a couple more things, too, that we can talk about. We'll talk about in a minute here. But important thing to remember is that there's advantages and disadvantages uh, associated with all of them. The fixed layout is definitely simpler to implement. But it really locks down the, the appearance of a page. And therefore, if you're viewing it in different environments, the page, can look, um, the page won't always look good, necessarily. What works on a big screen won't necessarily work on a small screen and vice versa. The relative ones and the floating ones are good because they accommodate themselves to the size of the screen. So they're more flexible to the user's environment. But they're a little more complicated to code. All right, A little trickier to do. Trickiest of all is that you can mix and match things. You know, you could have the header, for example, have a fixed size. Let's say, let's give it a width of 900 pixels. And then have the other things relatively sized. All right, there is going to be 900, and it's going to stay at 900. And those two down below, whoops. And those two down below it move based on the size of the page. Again, notice we get the horizontal scroll bar there, because we said that it's going to be 900 pixels wide. This is definitely uh, one of the areas that, if you haven't already, you'll be scratching your head over some of these things here. Because I, I promise you, some of these things 
don't necessarily appear apparent until you've tried it out and played with it and, and all that. So I can sort of give you the introduction and the book talks about things to do and so on. But really, by, by digging in and actually coding these things is where you'll see how all this stuff works. This is also the point where browser compatibility issues become a bigger deal. Therefore, you should start testing things across multiple browsers if you have not been doing that already. Trying to think if there's a, ah, there is one other thing. There is a position fixed. And this can actually be kind of cool. Because what I can do with something is, I can say, make a number seven. And let's base seven off of one. If I define something as having a position of fixed, what it will do is it will glue it down to that spot on the window, not to that spot on the document. So for example, if I were to say header, instead of position absolute, position fixed, maybe navigation, position fixed. If we go and view this now, notice as I scroll up and down, uh, as I scroll up and down, that stays fixed. Yeah. Actually, I should have based this one off of two, so let me go in and... one I want to use. Right, we'll, we'll keep it off of this one. But the idea is, is that with position fixed, it stays consistent with relative to the window. So it doesn't matter how you scroll, that stays in that position. That's different than a absolute position where the position really is based on the top corner of the document. So if I scroll up, this stays close to the top corner of the document. Whereas with fixed, it's based on the, the position of the window. So if I say fixed, it's locked into that place. Yes? So. Not really a background picture. A background picture will stay that way no matter what. What, what typically... What typically you see, actually, let me, actually, yeah, yeah, that's what you would do. I, I wasn't thinking for a second there. Yes, with fixed, you could, you could keep a background picture stuck. The other thing that you can do is you can do oftentimes with a navigation. So, for example, let's say you have a big page like this. with a header, a navigation, and then content. You may want this part to scroll, but this part stay nailed down. So you'll set the navigation as fixed, and then as this moves up and down, this stays locked in that position so that they can navigate to wherever they want to. That's, that's uh, another pretty effective way that that can be used. All right.
We'll see you up in lab. Stay dry.